you have your Bibles, grab a hold of God's Word and open them to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. The book of Numbers, chapter number 13. We're in a series today and uh, the two Sundays that follow, we'll finish this series up called Choosing Victory. Uh, it sounds like a funny title for a series of sermons. Wouldn't everyone choose victory? And yet, many people choose defeat. They could have victory. God wants them to have victory. And I know in their soul they want victory. And yet they uh, let the victory just kind of pass on by that God so desperately wants for them. And I think in their own heart of hearts, they want for themselves. I don't know of anybody that would just seek after defeat and hardship and ruggedness and pain. Surely we would want better. Surely we would want to know love and peace and joy. Is that not what we all bear in our heart of hearts? Is that? And yet, for many who know the way, they still don't, do not accept that way. And, and we, cannot, it, we, we cannot begin unless we begin as a Christian people, as a church, as those of us who have known truth, experienced truth, and are grateful for it, all victory begins with a personal relationship. With Jesus Christ. I think that we know that, we believe that, and yet we don't let that be the forefront of everything that we say and do, is that everything flows from a relationship with Jesus Christ. But yet it does. Everything flows from that. In this series, we're talking about the children of Israel who were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. But God heard their cries and sent a deliverer who, who uh, went down there and uh, God showed his power. And Pharaoh, the, the leader of Egypt, said, you must leave us. And they found the place, they found themselves at the Red Sea with mountains on both sides and an enemy coming from behind and uh, the Red Sea in front of them. And they had to make the choice. They had to walk it out to by the hand of God, by the grace of God, God parted the Red Sea and they walked through. But God brought them out. That's what we talked about last week. He brought them out of Egypt so that He could bring them into the promised land. The Red Sea is a picture of salvation. But the Jordan River is the picture of crossing over into the promised land, the land of victory. And in between is the wilderness. That's where Christians don't need to spend all of their life. For lost people, they need to get out of the slavery of sin and cross over in salvation. It's available. God wants to change us. He wants to give us new life. Like a newborn baby, we've been given everything we need. I mean, we're born with a brain. We're born with ears to hear, to eyes to see, a mouth to speak, feet, but yet we need to learn to walk. Even though we may have been fully together and all we needed when we were born, we needed to grow up, grow up from that. We need salvation or we'll live in death and be in death forever and ever and ever. I'm just going to ask right now that the Holy Spirit would remind us in our spirit that to spend eternity separated from God is the worst thing that could happen to any person. There is nothing in all the world that they may face. No pain, no hardship, no devastation, no brokenness. There is nothing as bad, and may the Holy Spirit speak it to our soul as a person who lives a life and dies without knowing Jesus Christ as the personal Savior and Lord. We need to be reminded of that because that is our mission. That is the sole purpose of New Holland Baptist Church. It's that people can come to know Christ and learn how to walk in the victory that He gives. In the Bible, Paul said it very plainly. I want to remind us. It's in Romans chapter number 8. 
in Romans, excuse me, Romans chapter number 10, verse number 8. The Bible says this, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord over all, listen to me now, is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We will not know fully everything that salvation brings until we see Him face to face. But surely those of us who know Christ as our Savior and Lord, we know some of those benefits even now. We know the sweetness of it and the goodness of it. But how sad it would be to have all the victory promised from Christ, but never to fully make it our own. Stand with me. Look in God's Word in Numbers chapter 13 as we look at the Scripture that we will follow today. Numbers 13, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Send men to spy out the land of Cana, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader from among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were the heads of the children of Israel. Now look in verse number 16. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Yahshua, or Joshua. Why did he change his name? Hoshea means this, salvation. But Joshua means this, Jehovah is salvation. There are a lot of people who are claiming salvation. But if you do not have salvation in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Greek term, is the same term in Hebrew of Yahshua. Jehovah is salvation. There is no victory. There is no salvation other than in Jesus Christ. Look in verse number 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Cana and said to them, go this way into the south. Go up to the mountains. You know, the Lord had to love northeast Georgia, right? He said, go to the south and go to the mountains. Isn't that good? Forgive me. I just I couldn't let that go by. Verse number 18. And see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the, the land is rich or poor, and whether these are forests there or not. Now listen to these words in verse 20. Be of good courage. Bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the blessings of the Word of God. We thank you that it shows us your will and your way for our life. But Lord, it's vain if we don't hear it. And hear it not only from the Word and the preaching of the Word, but hear it from your lips to our heart. So Lord, we pray for the great blessing of being able to hear what your words, why you gave them and what they can mean to us and how it can affect our lives and how we too can share in the victory that you had planned for them, but Lord, you also planned for us. Lord, I love these people and I pray your blessings upon them. And Lord, I pray for those that we don't know yet who need to know you. They need to walk out victory as well. So Lord, help us be the church that brings you honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Moses gathered the children together and said, of all the 12 tribes, what I want you to do is get the leader from each tribe. 
and then I want you to send them over. The Levites did not send over someone. They were to be the priest. But the, the sons of Joseph were divided into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. And the leader of each of these tribes were to cross over the Jordan River, to walk through this land that had been promised to Abraham close to 500 years earlier. It had been promised from the time that God spoke to Abraham while he was living in what you and I would call modern-day Iraq, Ur the Chaldees. And he left there and went to the promised land. And God said, I will make of you a mighty nation, like the stars in the heavens, like the sand on the sea. And that promise was given by God. And God who does not lie, but God who always comes through. God who promised. God who cannot and will not and does not want to ever let any of us down. Now it's time. They've been brought out of slavery. They've passed the Red Sea. They've seen the mighty hand of God. They saw the plagues in Egypt. They've seen the blessings of God. They've seen the fire that led them by night, the pillar of cloud by day. They've seen the victory. They've gotten a little taste of it. And now it's time to go take possession. Make it their own. Cities that they did not build. Gardens that they did not plant. Houses that they can just walk in and inhabit it. All of it given by the hand of God. Look what it says in verse number 27. Well, let me, let me, let me take off and start reading in verse number 21. So they went up. Spot out the land of the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahimon, uh, Sheshi, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. And Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol. And that, is, uh, that word Eshkol means cluster. And it says, and there they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes and carried it between two of them on a pole. Could you just imagine two men carrying this pole because the, the grapes, this just cluster of grapes was so great they could not carry it otherwise. So they're walking around with this huge cluster of grapes. Uh, and, and what it must have been like when they saw them. You think they had one of those... Um, a Selah moments, you know, when you read the Old Testament, every now and again you see that word, it'd just be right in the middle of something. You think, why'd they put that word there? Selah. And the word means, wow. What do you think about that? Maybe they had a, a Selah moment when they saw all those grapes there. They thought, this is amazing. This is so good. This is going to be so great. <clears throat> but it also says in verse 23, they also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of uh, Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. 40 days is in, in the Bible. Every time you see the term 40 days, it is a time of testing. It is a time of trial. Now they were sent in to, to spy out the land, to check it out. But what they didn't know was there was a trial that was going on. There was a testing that was going on. And the testing was going on among these 12 leaders. What did they think? How are they going to live? How are they going to lead? By the way, people are watching. People are listening. Look what it says in verse 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And, and, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and they showed them the fruit of the land. Could you just see those guys walking back with that big, those two poles and everybody's looking at that? I mean, everybody's saying, they're back. And they go and look at them and they think, wow, we're going to have some great jelly coming on. It's going to be good. Look at this. Look at the figs. Look at the pomegranates. This is going to be amazing. They've been down there in Egypt eating onions and leeks. God help us. 
Now they see the grapes and the pomegranates and the figs and their mouths are beginning to water and everything looks good. Their heart's beating. And, and, and listen to what it says here. And, and then they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. This is its fruit. But then look at the next word that is there. Nevertheless. Wouldn't it have been so much grateful if there hadn't have been that word nevertheless? Wouldn't there have been so much less pain if there hadn't have been the word nevertheless? An entire generation would not have been lost if they hadn't have said that word nevertheless. I wonder, as we live our life, as we live in the land flowing with milk and honey, as we live as the richest people in the world, as we live with the great education systems that we have, as we live with the great people that are around us and we take all of these things for granted, and yet the greatest thing that we have around us, the greatest resource that is in all the earth are the people that walk on it. And really, how great our lives would be if when we walk through life and we saw people, we just look and saw a sign above them every over every person that we saw and said, the sign said this, this is a wonderful, beautiful, glorious person that God loves. Maybe now and again we could look in the mirror and we could see the, the, the sign that's over us. It says this is a wondrous, glorious people that God loves you as well. But yet there's that word, nevertheless. It changes everything. It comes out of the heart of unbelief. And every one of us have said it from time to time. Would you agree? We've stand and we've stood and we've, we've seen the blessings of God and we, we, we know, church, we know. I mean, you're here today. You know God is good. You know that He loves. Oh, how He loves you and me. You are held by the Spirit of God. It is like the engagement ring until we get home at the marriage supper of the Lamb where all has been provided. But the same God who has provided heaven is with you down here on earth. And yet, when we see the things of earth and of life and we see the problems and the difficulties that seem to be there and the dissonance between our heart and the will of God, sometimes we don't choose victory. Sometimes we say, nevertheless. Look what it says here in verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. Okay. The cities are fortified and very large. All right. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites, they dwell by the sea. That's talking about the Red Sea. Or excuse me, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and also along the banks of the Jordan on both sides to the east and west. The Canaanites are there as well. Nevertheless, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be difficult. They're strong. They got walled cities. They're fortified. They're big and they're large and it's going to be difficult. I, I, I'm not too sure we can do this. They got some guys over there that are whoppers. I mean, they're just big. I don't know about fighting these people. Look, it says in verse 30. We can't skip verse 30. Praise God for verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people. I, I can almost hear, shh, be quiet, listen. Did y'all ever have one of those teachers in school that clap their hands and stomp their foot at you? Did it ever get your attention? Listen to me. Caleb got their attention and said, said let us go up at once. Right now. Let's not, no, no, y'all hush. We're going, let us go right now and take possession. 
for we are well able to overcome it. You could have just as easily said, we are well able to receive it. We are well able by the hand of God, Lord, for you to give it to us. But here was the problem. They were not looking at the hand of God, the powerful hand of God. They were looking at their own hand and feeling insufficient. That's our problem. We look at our own hand, our own thoughts and our own will. We look at how it affects us. We really like comfort and we stay away from anything that might take away our comfort. We'll fight for our comfort. We'll tell everybody else, you just don't understand. I don't know that I want to do that. Caleb says, we must go. Conversation continues, verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able. Boy, that's a confession. What a testimony. A testimony of God. Look, were they able to get to escape slavery in Egypt? Evidently not. They were there 400 years, but God brought them out. Were they able to cross over the Red Sea? If they were to stand on their own strength, they'd have been killed, every one of them right there. But God made a way. It's the same God. By the way, the same God that was with them is the same God that's with us. The same God who rose Jesus Christ from the grave is the same God that's within us. The same God that was there on Pentecost where 3,000 souls were saved that day is the same God that was with us. The same God that was with Paul when he went to Corinth and Ephesus and Thyatira and, and all those cities, Macedonia and everywhere. Same God that's with us. The same God that was with Billy Graham and Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody is the same God that's with us. The same God that was with your parents is the same God that's with us. And praise God, <clears throat> our prayer is the same God that's with us will be with our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren from generation to generation. We do not need to lose an entire generation because of our nevertheless. The land through which we have gone out of spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people who we saw in it are men of great statue. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. That's the truth. And so we were in their sight. That's a lie. When we looked at those great big whoppers, we looked at them and we looked at ourselves and we said, we're like grasshoppers. We're small, small, small. And, and we know it and they know it. No, not necessarily. Take your Bible and look over to Joshua chapter number 2. Joshua chapter number 2. And look in verse number 8. Joshua 2, verse 8. The children of Israel sent in spies as well. Two of them have reached a, a prostitute's house by the name of Rahab. And, and, and she hid them up on her roof. And at nighttime, she went up to talk to the spies. Let's hear a little bit of that conversation between Rahab and the spies. Now before they lay down, she came, up to the, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. What? She's living in Jericho. She's of the land, the promised land that God promised. What's her testimony? What's the testimony of this unbelieving woman? says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we, have, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. 
That was 40 years earlier when Rahab's saying this. We know. We heard what God did. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who are on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our heart melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord, I love this, your God, by the way, the Lord, their God, became her God too. As a matter of fact, let me just be plain about this. Not only did their Lord become her Lord, their God became her God, but she is found in the lineage of Jesus Christ. This is one of the great grandmothers of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on earth. What do you think about that? But here's the words that she is saying. As soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, right? Verse 12, now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give us a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. She believed more in the power of God than the 10 of the 12 spies that were sent in to begin with. Oh, we're like grasshoppers. Not according to Jesus. I got these things on here. You know why I wear these? Because y'all are real fuzzy without them. I mean, I can see you, but y'all don't look the same. Y'all know what I'm talking about? But when I put these things on, everything gets clear. You know what we need? When we're walking through life and everything seems to be distorted and a little fuzzy, we need to put on the eyes of faith. Where that which is distorted becomes clear. Where we can see not through our own eyes. My eyes, I'd be in trouble. But when I can see through the eyes of faith in Christ Jesus, it's not what I see, it's what he sees. It's not what I think, it's what he knows. It's what I believe because I have a great big God who is mighty and strong and able. And by the way, he can even use somebody like me. Oh, the God that we had. You know, the problem was they had lived 400 years in Egypt and they still thought like slaves. They were still under the bondage of small thinking. For 400 years, they worked hard. They were told what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it. And all they did was just live under the bondage with no thoughts of their own. And now the, God's freed them from that. Now they've got to, the, the great thoughts that God can place in our heart and our life uh, of seeing big things and great things and bold things and mighty things and the power of God and what God can do. And now we able to see those things, but now we have to choose those things and make them our own. We've got to see beyond this world and see the power of God who, who owns this world and holds this world. And we've got to see beyond the end of us and find the beginning of God. And we've got to see what God can do. And that's the eyes of faith. They didn't see themselves as warriors. They just saw themselves as brick masons. And they didn't understand grace. Brother Broadus talks about he loves the word grace, one of his favorite words. I believe it's probably one of the favorite words of many of you. But you know, we don't need to just know the word and sing the word, we need to live the word. That the God in heaven wants to do that which is so much undeserved on our behalf, but he, he wants to do so much for us. What we cannot achieve, he wants to achieve. It's going to do no good for us to come here today if in the next few moments you don't take what you know to be true, the power of the words of God, and make them your own. You have to believe not only that God can, but God will for you. You need to know that God will make a way when there seems to be no way. You need to 
walk away from the ideas of, I've never said, I don't believe we can do that. I don't know. That may cost us too much. That, I don't know that we can do that. We don't have this. We don't have that. We can't do that. We've never been able to do that. We failed. Are you slaves of failure? How many of y'all like to sing the song Victory in Jesus? Pretty good song, amen? Would you understand that by grace of God, He brought them out of slavery? By grace of God, He brought them to this place? By grace of God, He had already given it to them. It already belonged to them. The title deed had already been written. God had already signed it. All they had to do was walk it out. Listen to me now. Grace, the great gifts of God for us, are given and they're free but they must be gained. Salvation is free for all, but you must choose it. Victory is promised by God, but you must choose it. You must be willing to make it your own. This is the grace test. Go back to Joshua again. Joshua chapter 1. This is 40 years later after they shared the nevertheless, after an entire generation died in the wilderness. He's bringing them back to do it again. Here's the grace test all over again. Joshua 1 verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I have, am giving to you, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Not I will give in you. I have already given it to you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness of, uh, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, Mediterranean Sea, Towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Listen to these words. Listen to these words. I think you can almost hear Jesus say them. I will not leave you nor forsake you. He's with you. Christ is with you. I will not forsake you. You may be some in difficult places, but I'm with you. You may think it's hard, but I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you on your own. I'll be there for you. The power of God will be there for you. The facts are in. Will we believe? Them? The victory's already been won. We still have to walk it out. See, what God wants to, to do is He's going to do His part. He just wants to know, are you going to do your part? Believe. Do you believe? Do you believe? Then act like it. Act like it. Do you believe God is able? Act like it. You believe God is with you? Then claim the victory. Claim the victory. No. Believe. Trust. Set your mind on God. And act courageously. If the Spirit of God tells you to walk across the room and tell somebody about Jesus, are you willing to walk it out? They gave a bad report. But this is really what the bad report was saying. We believe God can. We're just not sure that we can. Slave mentality. Defeated before they even began. You know, I love in Malachi, the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, they talk about tithing in there. Money. And he says, just give. But then I love this one thing. I love this little caveat. He says, you're not sure you can do it? Try me. 
Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. He says, put me to the test. You don't think I can take care of you? Try me in this. You see the circumstances and you want to believe, but you're not sure in your heart that you can? I tell you what, put him to the test. Try him in it. You know what you'll find? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not let you down. He will be with you. Number two. We'd rather stay here than go forward. We can do this. We're comfortable here. We got an existence here. You know what they kept saying? <laughs> Why are we here? Let's go back to Egypt. Isn't it funny that in every generation they have to make this decision? Are we going to go forward or do we just want to stay here? I, it was after 40 years, the children of Israel were ready to go into the land. And, and the, the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh says, you know what, we're, we're cattlemen, we, we like this pasture land uh, on, on the east side of the Jordan River. We're just going to stay here, y'all go into the promised land. Moses said, no, you're not. No, you're not. Now, if you want to leave your children here and your herds here and your wives here, that's all right and fine. But you're going to come on and go with us. Yeah, but we want this land over here. We'll just take this. That's all fine and good. But you've got to walk out the victory before you can have victory anywhere. You see, what they wanted to do was they want to say, it, it, Lord, it's okay. We'll just take this lower thing. Don't ask me to do all that. I'll just accept this down here from your hand and that'll be good enough for me. God says, no, it's not. It's not what you choose for you. It's what God chooses for you. And yet so many people take the low route and give up on the victory. Number three, we miss the close intimacy of God. Church, listen to me. Listen to me well. Most of the time, we're just because we don't want to go through the hardship. We see the giants. We see the difficulties. We see the problems. And we say, I, I'd just rather not go through that. How many of you know when you've been through hardships and troubles and trials and problems and things that you thought were too big for you and, and you really didn't want to have to go through it, but yet you trusted God and during those times was some of the sweetest, you grew the most, most wonderful, most peaceful times. If you give up on the victory, you give up on the joy. You're cheating yourself. Just remember the words of Solomon. The man who tried it all and had it all, did everything that the world could offer today, but he looked back upon it and called it vanity. To gain all that the world has to offer, the one who had it all called it vanity. Now I want you to think about your loved one who didn't have everything that this world has to offer. Who lived the life of blessing and is now in the presence of God. You know what they tell you? It was worth it. It was worth it. And if they had it to do over, they would live more in faith, more in trust, more in belief. And that's really what New Holland's going to have to do today. In the days ahead, there may be some cities that we have to conquer. <laughs> there may be some things that we're going to have to walk out. But God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The mighty hand of God is there. Just be very courageous. Trust Him. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't doubt. Just believe.